All right. Thanks so much, Signe, and uh, for the introduction and everyone for your time and uh, attending this webinar. I really appreciate uh, your time and interest in this topic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump right into it. Um, so again, as Signe mentioned, my name is Nick Kijis. I'm a PhD student at Montana State University. I've been working under Dr. Sharon Hood, Greg Peterson, Rick Everett, and Dave McQuethy, my advisor at Montana State University. And I'm going to be kind of presenting uh, the first uh, chapter of my dissertation research to you all today, um, which is looking at growth and defense, so sp uh, specifically resin-based uh, defenses, so resin duct characteristics. Um, in uh, this iconic species, white bark pine, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about in a second here. Um, so, uh, kind of just right off the bat, I want to give a big shout out and thank you uh, to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, as well as Sal Salish Kootenai College, Salish and Kootenai Culture Committees, and the following individuals in particular Rick Jensen, Tony Ancashola Jr., Jim Durglo, and Michael Durglo Jr. Um, ultimately, this is a tribal project. All the data was collected on tribal land, and I'm just extremely uh, honored and privileged to have been able to take part in this research. Um, the areas that we were able to go to are really uh, uh, really special places, and I'm just extremely grateful for the opportunity to have been involved in this in this work. Um, so I kind of came on originally in 2016 as part of a larger fire history reconstruction kind of across the reservation. So as part of that effort, um, you know, uh, Rick and Dave and uh, others on my committee kind of found these, uh, this, established this network of sites across the reservation um, where we have um, tree ring data that we went and collected as well as um, nearby lakes, so we can look at the lake sediment, kind of tease apart longer histories of fire history um, in this area. And so as part of that effort, I was very fortunate to get a sample, um, you know, across these different sites um, between 2016, 2017, and 2018. And it was, um, you know, very diverse uh, gradient of, of sites and elevations here. Um, and we, you know, as part of that process, we collected several thousand tree cores and have been establishing, um, you know, dem demography data and kind of fire history data um, for these different areas. But two sites in particular are going to be kind of the focus of my talk today and are, are particularly special uh, locations, the Three Lakes Peak uh, site down kind of on the southern uh, edge of the reservation there, and then the Boulder site on the kind of eastern side of Flathead Lake there. And um, both of these sites have really beautiful, uh, healthy white bark pine populations, uh, which kind of served as the basis for, for my dissertation work. Um, so I'm going to just give a little bit of information kind of about each site. Um, so Three Lakes Peak, again, is kind of located in that southern um, mountain range between the reservation and Missoula. Um, there's um, a healthy white bark pine population at the site. We sampled 225 trees, which uh, encompasses 15 percent of our sample population at this area. Um, but mortality is also very high, as it is in uh, for white bark pine kind of throughout the northern Rockies, um, with about 73 percent mortality at this location, uh, due largely to, to documented instances of mountain pine beetle activity, especially in the 60s, 70s, and more recently in the 90s and kind of early 2000s, um, as well as white pine blister rust, which was kind of vectored into this broader region of the Rockies in the in the 1950s and is is, is prevalent um, at, at the sites. Um, so the Boulder site uh, is also a very healthy white bark pine population. There's actually more at this location than at Three Lakes Peak um, across our sample plots. Um, we sampled 476 white bark pine trees here, uh, as encompassed about 36% of the sample population, so pretty uh, significant. And uh, mortality in the site, on, you know, was also high as well, about 86% mortality. Again, from uh, documented instances of bark beetle um, primarily and, and white pine blister rust. Um, so for this study, and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on this in a minute, but we ended up identifying 60 trees at the Three Lakes Peak site and 84 trees at the Boulder site. And we had kind of pair, pairs of live trees and a corresponding dead tree for each of those live trees. So we ultimately established 30 pairs at Three Lakes and 42 pairs at Boulder. So kind of our total sample depth for this study, we had 144 trees, uh, 72 live and 72 corresponding dead, dead pairs. And you know, when I first got up there sampling, especially at Three Lakes in Boulder, I was just immediately um, kind of captivated, for lack of a better word, by just the dynamics I saw in these really amazing forests. Um, there is a lot going on in terms of uh, insect activity, um, fire, ac fire uh, disease. I mean, there's all of these things are uh, are di very dynamic within this system, and. I was really intrigued by, you know, kind of this contrasting image of these, uh, you know, these dead white bark pine trees, these kind of ghost white bark pine trees, um, and these contemporary live trees that are are just beautiful. I mean, the ones up there that the the, the tribe specifically has identified are are, um, are amazing, very beautiful trees, uh, physiologically very healthy, 
Um, so there's this kind of contrast at the site and it just really kind of got me interested in thinking like, wow, what what are some of the factors that may be just explaining so much of the dyna uh, the dynamics that we're seeing at this at this at these different locations. And as I mentioned, there's um, evidence of fire up there. So we got a lot of charcoal kind of on the bowls of some of these older snags. And there's also uh, evidence of blister rust, as I mentioned before as well. Um, and you can kind of see the spores there on that upper right picture of the blister rust, blister rust fungus. All right. And there's other, all sorts of other disturbances up there too. Uh, some notably grizzly and black bears, uh, which fortunately we never had any um, scary close encounters in our sampling, but they're definitely up there and there are signs of, um, of them all over the place. And they very much interact with their environment and are, interact with these trees as well. So just a little bit about white bark pine. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a very um, iconic tree species, considered a keystone species um, due to its kind of, um, the, the uh, breadth of ecolog ecological services it provides, which I'll outline in a minute here. But I really fell in love with white bark pine um, as part of my forestry program when we were kind of learning about different tree species in the Western US. And there's just something about this tree that's really amazing, has a really neat story. And, um, you know, again, just kind of the ecological importance of this species. So it grows at these high elevations where the roots typically help kind of stabilize rocky slopes, um, you know, increase soil, soil stability. Um, and through that, they actually also increase snowpack, you know, accumulation and retention times at these higher elevations and kind of modulate moisture loss um, to, to lower elevations. So they're hydrologically very important just based on kind of where they occur on the landscape. Um, but they're also a very important food source for a, a wide variety of animals, particularly grizzly bears who rely on their, you know, very fatty and nutritious seeds, you know, roughly about 70 calories a seed. Um, so very nutritious. As a, as a food source, especially in um, heading into, into the winter months. And one really neat thing about white bark pine is it's kind of, you know, over thousands of years has evolved this uh, relationship with Clark's Nutcracker. It's a member of the Corvid family. And these little birds are, are incredible. So they'll actually go around and uh, pick out a bunch of seeds and cache them kind of all over the landscape. And those, un, you know, those caches that are forgotten eventually will sprout, uh, you know, the white bark pine forest that, that we see today. And I think one really neat thing about them is they, they're very kind of peculiar in how they cache and they like kind of open, recently disturbed type of landscape. So, so something you might see after a fire or after some other type of disturbance. And one big benefit of that is it gives white bark pine a really nice competitive advantage um, when it's cached into those areas directly because um, it's pretty hardy i mean pines in general are, are fairly hardy um, you know typically grow well when conditions are favorable um, so it's kind of this neat neat relationships that, that has evolved and we definitely the whole time we were sampling we saw the clark's nutcrackers up there and uh, they definitely were you know squawking at us when we were when we were uh, upset now <laughs> we were too close and you know they they definitely they're just up there doing this all the time it's pretty uh, remarkable to think about um, so really really important species um, but there's a lot of concern about the future of white bark pine um, especially in relation to things like fire um, so kind of the one of the thoughts is that uh, you know decades of fire suppression has potentially allowed for the buildup of fuels and especially um, shade tolerant species kind of in the understory. So species like subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce that could over time uh, overtop and kind of outcompete white bark pine. So fire in these systems, you know, they've evolved with fire. Um, it's in the no Northern Rockies where fire is a, is a very frequent and common disturbance. Um, or a very important disturbance, I should say. Um, so fire typically would kind of come through and you know clear some of the understory, uh, kind of prevent those seedlings from establishing. Um, so there is kind of the thought that potentially you know a uh, century of fire suppression may have uh, altered uh, the fire regimes in some of these systems, which may have negative implications for white bark pine. Uh, kind of one of the other interesting things about fire and white bark pine is it seems. Uh, somewhat sensitive to fire. So despite having kind of evolved with this disturbance on the landscape um, in some more kind of recent efforts to try to get fire back into white bark pine systems, primarily through prescribed fire, um, some of the results have actually been unexpected um, as far as mortality. So finding kind of unexpectedly high mortality post fire um, in some instances as high as 50 plus percent of you know trees that weren't meant to die um, end up dying um, through those through those burn operations, so if I, we're not really fully sure yet, I'd say on kind of the the full role of fire in the white bark system, it's it's very complicated for sure, um, and it's definitely something that uh, warrants a lot of further uh, research.
And on top of, um, you know, fire, uh, we also have good evidence of beetle activity at this site, again, uh, particularly through the uh, 60, 50s and 60s, and then more recently in the 90s and kind of early 2000s. And there's uh, pretty extensive evidence of beetles at the site, um, in term, you know, including um, pitch on, on trees that are um, under active attack, as well as um, the galleries on the kind of other underside of the bark tissue, uh, the larval galleries um, as well. And as I mentioned again, uh, blister rust is also common here. Um, we noted it on um, several several of the individuals that we sampled. So kind of you know again thinking back to just that really neat kind of delineation of these these kind of dead trees and and these corresponding live healthy trees, which really got me thinking like what is it about those live trees that's allowing them to persist on this landscape? And is there anything that we can uh, discern from these from the the individuals who ultimately came to mortality. Um, so as part of my undergraduate work, I'd been kind of exposed to this uh, resin ducts and conifers through my advisor there, Dr. Jeffrey King at Humboldt State University, and uh, I was immediately enamored by kind of this concept of resin ducts. They're really really neat. Um, so in conifers and pines in particular, you know, they develop these resin duct structures annually, um, just as they do tree rings. So we can actually go back in time and and look at these and measure them and get some of some sort of idea for how the tree was allocating resources to both growth, you know, the ring widths, as well as to uh, resin-based defenses, so specifically these resin duct structures. And the resin ducts allow pines to kind of produce, mobilize, and store uh, this folio resin, um, which it then flushes through the resin duct network to sites of injury. So say uh, an active attack by a bark beetle or a fungal um, infection. So the system will kind of flush those areas with this oleo resin, which is loaded with all sorts of compounds uh, particularly mono sesquin diterpenes um, that have really demonstrated uh, insecticidal and fungicidal properties. Um, in addition, the resin itself is just, it's viscous, it's thick, it's a mechanical deterrent for the beetles, in addition to being a kind of a chemical, chemically toxic. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that kind of toward the end of my talk when I um, go into kind of my next phase of my research here, but uh, just this idea of kind of resin ducts as a, as a proxy for tree defense. Um, I, is really interesting to me and kind of got my mind thinking about how we could work, um, use that in this kind of system. And so more recently in the past, um, you know, decade in particular, there's been kind of a growing number of studies that have looked at these resin duct characteristics, um, specifically in scenarios of bark beetle activity. And there's been some findings that have shown pretty clear distinctions or differences in resin duct properties between these trees that you know persist through these these bark beetle outbreaks and the trees that ultimately die in the, as part of these outbreaks and uh, a lot of these studies um, have been you know kind of pioneered by by my committee member Sharon Hood she's done a lot of really incredible work um, in that sense and so you know a lot of work has been done on ponderosa pine uh, lodgepole pine there's a uh, Scott Ferenberg did a really nice study looking at kind of lodgepole and limber pine resin duct characteristics um, Monica Gaylord's looked at, uh, you know, some resin duct characteristics in uh, pinion pine, kind of down in the southwestern U.S., but really nothing had been applied to white bark pine uh, ecosystems, kind of um, one of the closer studies was looking at, uh, you know, resin ducts in sugar pine, kind of in response to disturbance, but um, really nothing for, for white bark pine per se. So this seemed like a really neat kind of opportunity to apply some of those same techniques that have been used in other studies into this white, you know, novel white bark pine ecosystem. Um, so, as I mentioned, we, you know, we're up there for uh, three years as part of this larger fire history study. So as part of that process, we retrieved thousands of increment cores um, from, uh, you know, trees uh, across the reservation. And from that kind of broader pool of data, we were then able to go in and kind of identify our pairs of our live and our dead trees. And we were really, uh, uh, we had a good, uh, we were pretty conservative in how we paired individuals because we tried, we wanted to try to control for differences in size and, and biological development, you know, ontogeny, as well as um, differences in microsite characteristics because, you know, just a little bit of a difference in aspect can have big, you know, big differences for soil moisture and biologically available water and things like that. So um, we really try, wanted to try to control for that in so much as we could. Um, so we paired our trees based on size. So they had to be no, there had to be a difference of no greater than three centimeter dBH. Um, and we compare, we paired them based on distance. So they had to be, you know, ideally within 10 meters, but no greater than 15 meters of one another, uh, just to try to mitigate that as much as we could. Um, and then using the process of cross dating, um, you know, we actually go in and assign calendar uh, years to each of these rings. And cross dating is a really, um, 
really awesome, amazing process whereby you can kind of build a chronology from your live trees and then use that chronology to, um, as well as other regional chronologies to go back and date, you know, dead material that died, um, you know, in some cases, uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, so, you know, once that was a challenge in and of itself was getting the chronologies developed for these sites. But once we had them, we had, you know, accurate dating on all of our live and our dead pairs. So, at that point, we were able to kind of identify these common um, overlapping periods of growth. So in this example down on the bottom of the screen, kind of this 1922 to 1970 shared period of growth between that live and that dead pair. And once everything was cross-dated and we had identified our pairs, we then went in and measured all of the individual ring widths so we could start to get a sense for, for growth, tree growth. And we measured all of the resin ducts as well uh, to get, a, again, a sense of, of defense, so these resin-based defenses. and Ultimately, we ended up measuring 3,700 plus rings. So our time series kind of spans from 1911 to 2014 at this site. And we measured 11,700 plus resin ducts, which was a lot more than I had uh, kind of initially thought I'd be measuring in this study. So it turns out white bark is actually a really uh, great species to study resin ducts. It's a pretty prolific producer of them. Uh, but definitely that uh, should factor into the time of <laughs> if anyone's thinking of um, pursuing this. It, it kind of caught me by surprise a little bit. Uh, but it was it was great more data all right so kind of the large research questions kind of driving this project for me were you know are what are the differences in physiology or are there differences in phys physiology and specifically radial growth and these resin duct properties between these live and these dead trees and if there are differences i was curious you know well what what property or properties are most important um, in these surviving individuals you know does anything kind of rise to the top as being a uh, the most important factor um, kind of uh, distinguishing these live from these dead trees and i had two hypotheses here that were largely based on other research that's demonstrated that you know vigorous trees trees that are growing well can kind of for lack of a better term have it all they can both grow well and be well defended um, they essentially just have access to a larger carbon pool whether that be through um, maybe superior competitive advantage um, or maybe just genetics maybe they're just a better competitor but typically um, you know these trees that are, are vigorous and are growing well um, can also have robust resin based defenses um, you know there's not a lot of evidence for a trade-off per se between those two things. So just kind of out of these this larger set of studies, I hypothesized that, hey, well, the live white bark pine that are up on um, the site and that have persisted through these um, you know, recent bark beetle disturbances are probably better growers. So they're probably gonna grow more than their dead counterparts over the full record. Um, and because they're you know, just better competitors, they're gonna have more carbon to use every year. So they're gonna just invest more of that as well into resin-based defenses. So I kind of hypothesized that they would not only grow more than the dead trees, but they'd have more robust defensive features. So specifically larger resin ducts, producing more resin ducts, things like that. Um, so I'm gonna get kind of right into the results now, which uh, kind of agreed and disagreed with my hypotheses a little bit. Uh, so we're gonna talk about growth first, and I'm just gonna take a quick minute on this first slide to kind of walk you through some of the figures, because you're gonna see them on the next few slides as well. Um, so up in the top left here, this is just a kernel density plot, which looks at the relative distribution of whatever variable, so in this case, growth, um, between our live and our dead trees. So live being that kind of green color, and then dead being that kind of tan color. And surprisingly, kind of over the full record, we saw that the dead trees actually grew more, 22% more than the live trees on average over their full record. So it's kind of counter to what I had thought I would see. Um, and then this is a plot that I just pulled up. Is uh, you're, I'll explain this one too, because you're gonna see this in the next few slides for the other metrics we'll look at. Um, but this is essentially just a difference plot. So on the x-axis, we have year, so the year of our uh, time series. And on the y-axis, we just have the difference in whatever uh, property, so in this case, growth. So we essentially took growth for the live pair, subtracted growth for the dead pair, and then whatever the remaining value is, if it's negative, then that indicates a greater value within the dead pair, uh, within the dead tree, and then if it's positive, that indicates a greater value uh, within the live tree. Um, so over the full record, really from like the beginning of the record through 19, about 75, um, dead trees generally grew more than the live trees. They had, again, 22% greater growth on average. Um, but kind of post-1975, we saw you know, this kind of inflection point whereby uh, growth in those dead trees really started to decline relative to, those, to the live trees. So again, kind of a little unexpected. I just assumed kind of over the full record, the live trees would be the better growers, but it's not really the case for, for the majority of the record. Uh, when we looked at resin duct production, this also kind of went counter to my hypothesis, um, whereby the dead trees actually produced more resin ducts, 20% uh, more on average than the live trees. And when we look at the series, again, this is 
pretty consistent through about 1980, um, whereby production then started to decrease in those dead trees relative to the live trees. Um, but over the majority of the record, the dead trees were producing more of the actual resin duct structures. But on this next slide, uh, this is really kind of one of the big striking takeaways to me on this paper. It's just the live trees produce much larger resin ducts, so 50 per six. 56% larger on average than the dead trees. So despite producing fewer of them, they're just producing much, much bigger um, resin duct structures than the trees that, that ultimately died. And when we look at kind of, again, the time series of this, we really see, um, you know, over the full record, uh, the, the live trees were just consistently producing larger resin ducts than, than their dead pairs. Um, yeah, and we look at kind of the next metric here. So this is duct area. And this is a kind of a nice proxy for resin flow. Theoretically, you know, a larger resin duct area is gonna to translate to um, kind of an increased capacity to mobilize resin through the resin duct system. Um, and again, we saw a pretty striking difference with um, the live trees having about 48% larger duct area on average than the dead trees. So in theory, again, kind of translating to a, just a broader capacity to mobilize resin through this network. Um, and again, this was a consistent trend over the full time series uh, for the live trees, whereby they're just always producing larger resin ducts with a greater kind of duct area relative to those dead trees. Uh, so when we look at duct density, so this is actually a measure that's um, standardized to, to tree ring growth. So this gives us a kind of a better sense within a given year, um, you know, within say, you know, a given annual year, um, what's the density of the resin ducts that are being put on within that year. And we saw that this was actually greater in the dead trees um, by 18%. So they, were, they had a greater density overall than the live trees. Uh, but when we look at the time series, you know, this is, it, there wasn't really much of a difference until about kind of 1975, whereby density started to increase, resin duct density started to increase in those dead trees relative to the live trees. Um, and I kind of interpreted this somewhat as a, um, somewhat of a stress response, you know, as these trees are kind of fading off the landscape, um, they're producing more ducts, so the density is going up, um, but they're smaller. Um, than the, than the live trees. And really, I, I kind of, again, interpreted that as a stress response. Like they're fading off the landscape. They're just going to start, they're producing more ducks as kind of a last ditch effort to, um, you know, bolster those, those defenses. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's a game to mortality. Uh, but that was a little interesting as well. I, I kind of, again, thought that the live trees would just have kind of broader uh, density and, and broader size and everything than the dead trees. So that was a little bit surprising. Um, and then relative duct area. So this is another measure that's standardized to tree ring growth. And this gives us kind of a snapshot for, hey, in a given year, what percent of carbon are you allocating to growth and to these resin duct, prop, you know, resin duct uh, structures? And again, this was a big kind of takeaway. So about 57% uh, larger relative investment annually in these live trees in, into these resin duct structures than the dead trees. Um, and this was consistent over the full length of the record. Um, we didn't really have a, a trend in the time series, but just over the full record, these live trees, again, were not only producing larger resin ducts, but were using a greater percentage of their annual carbon um, into the development of these resin duct features relative to the trees that ultimately died. And kind of when we plot all, you know, we pull all this together and kind of plot it out. Uh, so this is a principal component analysis, which is kind of a nice way of distilling down some really um, uh, high level data into kind of a nice uh, visual representation. So we have kind of two axes here depicted and we kind of see these two groups really separate out our live trees and our dead trees based purely on kind of resin duct morphology. So kind of uh, splitting them along the uh, dimension one there. So things like differences in resin duct size, area and, and relative duct area, which are all greater in our live trees and duct density, which is greater in our, our dead trees kind of pulling out the data there. Um, and then in PC2, um, our growth and our resin duct production, which again, were greater in the dead trees kind of pulling out uh, variability there. Um, so overall, you know, just differences in this re in these resident properties explained a considerable amount, about 75% of variability within the data. Um, and we did again see this clear distinction um, between live and dead trees, um, some clear differences in the resident characteristics. And these are kind of the last two plots I'm going to show you on this study, but these are just conditional density plots. So it's kind of just another way to look at the data. This essentially just describes how the distribution of a categorical variable, so in this case, live or dead, is gonna change over a numerical variable. So in this case, resin duct size. And there's a lot I'm kind of glossing over in this paper. One of the things we did was um, some logistic regression modeling to try to identify what variables are most important in influencing mortality. And we kind of came away in all of our top models, it was resin duct size and relative duct area were the big ones that kind of consistently came up in our top model. So we kind of interpreted that as those being the kind of most important factors, or the 
the biggest factors, the biggest differences between these live and these dead trees. Um, so with resin duct size, you know, when we plotted this, we almost saw this kind of immediate threshold right at around 0 0.01 millimeters, uh, square millimeters on resin duct size, whereby if you're a tree that's producing you know, that or larger resin ducts, you have a much greater probability of surviving on this landscape. Whereas based on this data and this context, if you're one of the trees producing smaller resin ducts than that on average, you have a much greater probability of mortality at this site. And similar, when we look at resin duct relative area, we kind of, again, just saw this threshold whereby if you're allocating a certain percentage of your carbon uh, to resin duct structures, um, you know, if you're invest at least that amount, you're going to have a much greater probability of survival, whereby if you invest less than that amount, you're going to have an increasingly higher chance of mortality at the site. So just in kind of a quick summary of, of this study, so we found ultimately that, uh, you know, resin duct size and relative duct area um, were greater in the trees that survived recent disturbances that are at our, at our study site. So specifically, you know, again, very well documented instances of Mount Pine Beetle activity. Um, and then we kind of, you know, teased apart the data, we ultimately found that resin duct size and relative duct area were kind of the most important variables that predicted mortality, you know, that consistently showed up in our top models um, for predicting mortality. And really, this is kind of the first evidence um, to our knowledge that is comparing kind of growth and defense uh, characteristics across pairs of live and dead white bark pine trees. Um, as I had mentioned, a lot of this work has been done in ponderosa pine. I guess the closest corollary would be Scott Fernberg's study, which looked at limber pine. Um, but they actually found some different results in limber pine, uh, whereby live trees produce smaller resin ducts. So you know, that's a whole nother can of worms that we can we can get into later. Um, so there seems to be some, you know, some pretty interesting differences that could relate to species. Um, so it, it was just kind of neat to see um, those same techniques being applied into this white bark ecosystem and finding some some pretty interesting differences between our live and our dead trees and their growth and uh, resin based defenses. So kind of just in summary, you know, at this location, again, we have a pretty well documented recent uh, history of mountain pine beetle activity and that's driven, you know, it's, it's a selective force and in this context, the trees that have persisted through this disturbance by the time that we sampled them, you know, uh, it was beneficial to have larger resin ducts with greater relative duct area. Those trees were alive at the time of sampling versus the trees that died that had smaller resin ducts. So it seems like a pretty um, advantageous strategy in this system given kind of the contemporary disturbance pressure. Um, but you can imagine things are complicated. There's a million shades of gray and we have to consider not only the contemporary window in which we're sampling, but the longer kind of uh, generational and evolutionary history of these, of these organisms. And you can imagine probably at times, beetle activity may not be as strong of a driver in modulating growth and resin-based defenses as some, say something like competition, um, which may favor, you know, kind of a, a, greater, a greater investment in growth, kind of prioritization of growth. Um, and, you know, you can imagine how things like wildfire and things like drought could also interact to kind of shape how a tree is ultimately investing in growth and defense. And so I guess kind of one of the, the takeaways I'm saying is, you know, it seems advantageous in this, based on our study, that resin duct size and area were important, but in maybe another context, maybe that strategy of greater growth, you know, greater investment in growth may have proved favorable in the past or may prove favorable again in the future. Um, so it's, I think one of the biggest things is that you know these multiple disturbances interact over uh, very complicated time scales and select for different growth and defense strategies in white bark pine and it's difficult to say like one strategy is better over another we just have to recognize that there's there's important differences and and some strategies may play out favorably under a certain set of conditions and other strategies may play out favorably under a different set of conditions and so i think really it's important the, the biggest takeaway to me is it's just incredibly important to maintain genetic diversity within these landscapes um, kind of by maintaining that diversity we're buffering ourselves against future and and often unpredictable changes in in climate in species interactions in uh you know trophic interactions and things like that um so you know a, a, a great example is um kind of the prevalence of um you know rest resistance which is is incredible um kind of feat of engineering and human creativity um, to be able to kind of distill down the the gene in conifers that 
confers resistance to white pine blister rust. And so there's been very uh, incredible efforts to kind of breed trees that are rust resistant and to kind of start begin planting them in a lot of these locations. And I think in a lot of locations, that is an incredible strategy. And it's very, um, it's probably the right strategy in a lot of cases, but there is a lot of things we don't know about how rust resistance interacts with say resin-based defenses. That's a giant black box mystery mark. We don't know if, uh, you know, increased rust resistance comes at the, at the cost of resin-based defenses. So it's a great research area. Uh, we definitely need more research on that. Um, and it's just something to keep in mind. You know, if we ever, I'm never a fan of putting all my eggs in any basket because life's unpredictable and it can change. Um, you know, so if we put all our eggs in the blister rust basket, we could potentially be exposing ourselves to some, you know, uh, some mountain pine beetle related exposure later. And again, not saying that with any authority, I'm just thinking, saying it's, it's something to think through. There's a lot of um, ways that these different things can interact um, that need to be teased apart and kind of understood. Um, so I think, again, just kind of that effort to maintain as much of that genetic diversity on the landscape is, is really important. Because um, again, these species have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and they've you know, responded to, to shifting changes and disturbance in the past. Um, so they have kind of a built-in capacity um, to respond to some degree to some of these changes in the future. Granted, there's, there's a lot of unknowns, again, with blister rust being kind of an aggressive exotic pathogen and everything, um, but definitely things to think through. All right, so just real quick, I'm gonna kind of outline just some of the next steps of my research and where uh, where this is going. Um, so, you know, I've outlined kind of the importance of, of resin duct structures, but that's really only one side of the token. Kind of the other and arguably more important side of that is the resin itself and kind of the chemical composition of that resin. Um, and there's a lot of studies that have demonstrated um, the, the importance of, of certain compounds, so specifically monoterpenes, um, that have demonstrated linkages to bark beetle behavior and more, more uh, bark beetle behavior and attack success. Um, so I was really curious, you know, we saw these differences in white bark pine resin duct structures, but what about the resin chemistry? Um, so kind of along with Drs. Amy Trowbridge and Dr. Kenneth Rafa at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, you know, we've been analyzing the resin chemistry on a subset of these individuals. And so in 2018, we went to the Boulder site and we kind of identified from that fire history study um, some suitable pairs for this work. And we found ultimately 30 uh, white bark pine and 30 corresponding lodgepole pine because um, we were curious to see kind of what, if there were differences in the resin chemistry and kind of what the degree of difference was between these two species. And so we ultimately sampled, you know, 30 of each, and we paired them pretty conservatively as we did with the mortality study. So they were paired again based on size and distance with uh, no, di no greater difference in three centimeter TBH to try to control for differences in, in uh, you know, age and development, um, and no, di no greater difference than 10 meters, uh, 15 meter max in distance to try to control for some of those microsite, um, some of the microsite variability. Um, so we also tried to kind of stratify our sampling as much as we could across um, kind of higher stand densities and areas of lower stand densities kind of across the Boulder site. And we were interested in trying to assess local competition around these trees as well, around each of our sampled white bark and lodgepole pine trees. Because um, really, as far as comp the role of competition on constitutive resin-based defenses is also somewhat of a uh, black box. There's a little, been a little bit of work, two studies that I'm aware of that have looked at competition, kind of the influence uh, on resin chemistry, and one that's looked at kind of the role of competition on resin duct structures. Uh, but it's definitely an area that's um, pretty uh, poorly understood. So we thought maybe we could try to uh, look at the kind of competition around these individuals and see if that had any um, influence on, on the resin chemistry, the constitutive chemistry. So within that vein, we kind of sampled everything greater than one centimeter DBH within five meters of each of our focal trees, each of our white bark and lodgepole pine. And then to a distance of 10 meters, we became a little, uh, little more conservative and we sampled everything that was over five centimeter DBH. Just to again, try to get a sense of, hey, does the local uh, density and composition of species um, have an influence on, on resin duct structures and constitutive resin chemistry? And so we removed a, a small piece of uh, the phloem tissue as part of that effort. And that was put on dry ice and shipped to the University of Montana where we uh, processed these samples. So you have to finally chop them up and then distill them through uh, a couple different compounds depending on what you're processing for. Uh, so diterpenes, for instance, are processed very differently um, from mono and sesquiterpenes. Um, so we were eventually able to kind of process um, samples for our 60 trees and running using the gas chromatography mass spectrometer, we were able to develop uh, chromatographs um, 
which is basically just a signature of all of the chemical compounds in, in that resin sample and that uh, phloem sample. And with a <laughs> good deal of patience and training from Dr. Strowbridge and Rafa, I was able to eventually kind of uh, build a chemical profile for the white bark and the lodgepole pine trees. And this is the only figure I'm gonna show you from this study. Um, I don't wanna put the cart before the horse on this study. It's still kind of under, it's under review right now. Um, but we did see some really clear differences in the resin chemistry between these two species. And I think, um, you know, specifically in regards to some of the compounds that we saw, there's some really interesting things going on. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few really quickly, and then I'm going to kind of end it here. Um, but really, in our lodgepole pine trees, we see this much greater concentration of alpha and beta philandrine. So I don't know if you can see my cursor right now, but I'm going to kind of hover over those. And beta philandrine in particular is a compound that bark beetles ho use for host identification. So as they're you know flying over the landscape, they don't rely on eyesight like uh, me and you to you know find their trees. They rely on kind of the chemical bouquet that these trees are emitting to find the individuals that they're ultimately going to colonize. And beta philandrine is a big part of that of that process. They tend to just hone in on this compound, which is produced in much greater quantities in lodgepole pine, and that tends to actually actually agree with what we see in the field, whereby when given a choice, lodgepole kind of will gravitate toward, uh, excuse me, mountain pine beetle will kind of gravitate toward large lodgepole pine over white bark pine, even though white bark pine may actually be more favorable, which I'll talk about in just a sec here. Um, but we see, so we see this much greater concentration of these uh, alpha and beta philandrine, which again agrees with kind of field observations. Um, but we also see more compounds that are detrimental to bark beetles. So some, you know, this enantomer of uh, uh, delta limonene and four alianosol, uh, which is also known as estragol. You know, limonene is highly toxic to bark beetles, and uh, alianosol estragol is um, a really, really um, efficient prohib um, inhibitor of enzyme production. So these things are actually detrimental to the bark beetles and hinder success. Um, but, and you know, we found those in greater concentration in the lodgepole. Whereas within the white bark, we found greater concentration of, you know, alpha pinene, which the beetles actually use as a synergist in the kind of biological synthesis of their aggregation pheromone. So they actually monopolize this, this terpene from the tree and use it to ultimately turn into an aggregation pheromone that calls other beetles to the tree. So they kind of co-opt this resource from, from the tree. And so we saw greater quantities of that in the white bark. We also saw greater quantities of the bee myrcene, um, which is another kind of catalyst to a lot of these biological processes in the mountain pine beetle uh, ecology. So despite being more attractive to the bark beetle, um, they're actually probably better fitted within the lodgepole. There's more resources there for them to kind of synthesize their aggregation pheromones. And the phloem is also typically thicker in white bark pine. So it's kind of a better just buffer, better space to live for them and their larvae. Um, but again, when we see, when given a choice, the beetles will kind of gravitate toward lodgepole. So there's some really interesting kind of dynamics at play here. Um, that the, the, the resin chemistry may help uh, kind of illuminate. And again, I don't want to talk too much about that right now, um, but I'm going to kind of leave that as a cliffhanger, hopefully, um, and as an opportunity, you know, once that research is a little bit further along to come back and, and push it and share that with you all. Um, so with that being said, again, just a really big thank you. I can't, I can't say thanks enough to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, uh, the Salish Kootenai College and the Salish and Kootenai Culture Committees, as well as Rich Jansen, Tony Inkashola Jr., Jim Durglow, and Michael Durglow Jr., who again, were all absolutely critical for this research. I, I just am so privileged to have been able to come up to tribal lands and, and help um, conduct this study. And it, it's just a really, it's a big honor for me. So a big thank you to the tribes and to these individuals. Um, and then as well to my advisory committee, excuse me, my advisory committee, uh, collaborators, research assistants, field assistants, lab assistants, uh, you know, it takes a village uh, to, run, to run these things. So I certainly, uh, you know, have a lot of credit to give to um, these people who have seen me, you know, through the best of it and through the worst of it as well. And so with that, um, you know, I might be a little bit ahead of schedule, but I'll go ahead and um, open it up to any questions you all have. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. That was a great presentation. Um, we do have some questions. And again, if you have a question for Nick, please type it into the question pane um, and I'll go ahead and try to get to as many as possible. Um, and we'll follow up with email on questions that may go unanswered. So. The first question, did all of the dead trees die from mountain pine beetle, or did white pine blister rust play a role in the mortality of the paired trees? That's a really good question. And honestly, we don't, we can't say for sure because we weren't up there um, when the trees died. Um, but we do, I mean, we, we inferred bark beetle 
related deaths based on, um, you know, on those dead trees. So we looked for galleries along the bowl and um, the vast majority of them, like over 86% um, had blue stain fungus in the, in the increment core, um, which is a fungus that's vectored in by the bark beetles when they're colonizing a tree. Um, but it, as far as saying for definitively like, yes, mountain pine beetle killed this tree or, or white pine blister rust killed this tree, uh, we, don't, we don't know. And it's probably very likely that it may have been an, uh, an interaction between those two. Um, so that's something that I think is it's a really good point and something that I would I would like to to research more as well, um, specifically isolating out you know and maybe more of a controlled experiment because that's kind of one challenge as we're working in these natural ecosystems where these factors are interacting all the time, um, but maybe in more of a controlled environment we could could get at differences in hey well what are white bark what is white pine blister rust specifically doing to physiology and what is mountain pine beetle doing to physiology and how are those how are those the same or different. Um, so I think that's a really good question. Okay, thanks. Um, this is more of a, a comment, but I don't know if you have any anything further to um, say about it. But uh, your discussion about genetic diversity was addressed in Ponderosa Pine uh, years ago by Professor Yan Linhart. Um, the process is diverse, diversifying selection. So in other words, there are multiple selection pressures, some more pre prevalent than others over time. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to elaborate on on, on that discussion. Yeah, you know, I think that's I think the overtime is the really critical part there. And I think that's one important thing to think about with white bark pine. And there's kind of a lack of, of paleoecological studies that have looked at white bark pine, but there is a really good one by um, Virginia Glacius and Kathy Whitlock uh, in 2015 that um, you know they looked at these lot these um, lake sediment records that span hundreds of thousands of years, and they identified um, you know white bark pine slash limber pine. Unfortunately, we can't distinguish between the two in the paleoecological record because their pollen is identical or it's too similar. Um, but we did see just a big increase in pinus strobus pollen in the past, um, especially at the thermal um, optimum about 10,000 years ago when things were a lot hotter and drier than they are now. We actually saw a big increase in white bark pine, limber pine pollen um, kind of coinciding with those warmer temperatures and that increased fire activity, especially at lower elevations. So it's possible, and it's not, I don't know, but I think there's a lot there and there's a lot of really interesting things to think about. But I definitely think, yes, over long scales, like these, um, these different selective pressures interact differentially to kind of modulate um, how these trees respond and how they grow in their environment. So I guess it's a, it's a really, really important point. And I think uh, definitely kind of another uh, research need for not only white bark pine, but a lot of pines in particular, like how, um, you, you know, cause another big thing about resin duct development, and this is, I'm going off on a tangent now, so I'll, I'll cut myself short, but we don't really know how resin ducts change over the growth of a tree either, over the life of a tree, um, you know, how does a resin duct anatomy in a 10 year old ponderosa pine you know differ from a 50 year old ponderosa pine like we could make some pretty educated guesses and we'd probably be you know pretty close but we did there's no studies that have specifically looked at that so i think there's a lot of variables there to think through uh, but yeah really really great comment great thank you um okay did you do any correlations with resin ducts like size or number with the presence of blister rust uh, you know, we we didn't do any sort of um, correlation with blister rust just because we didn't have, again, kind of a um, clear indication in a lot of the samples that the tree was specifically killed by blister rust. So again, I think that'd be something I'd be really interested in looking at in maybe a future study is really saying like, hey, we know these trees have blister rust, let's go specifically target them. Um, because, you know, we were kind of, we were sampling within that broader fire history study. So we stuck to the fire history plots and we didn't do any sort of opportunistic sampling. So we were kind of just sampling with trees that had already been um, identified and mapped as part of that study. Um, but I think what would be really neat is to go, yeah, look at specifically, hey, this tree has blister rust. Um, let's look at, let's take a core, look at the growth and defense and, and see if there's any correlations versus ones that aren't, aren't showing blister rust. So yeah, I think that's a, a great avenue for future research. Okay, and this is a question I also had. It seems like there's a clear deflection point around 1975. Are there any environmental or weather data sets that can give some insight into a possible driver of the difference in tree responses? Uh, so I, yeah, that's a great question. I'd actually really like to open that up to the audience because I've been kind of puzzling the 1975 inflection too, because it's pretty clear in a lot of cases. And I really don't have a firm 
answer. I've got some ideas as to what we're seeing there. And we did do a big climate correlation. I kind of glossed over all that in this presentation for simplicity, but we did do a pretty fa uh, fairly in-depth um, climate analyses where we, we gathered a bunch of the PRISM climate data from our sites. And we looked at how relationships in these growth and defensive features in response to seasonal changes in climate. And really we didn't see, uh, I mean, the biggest thing we saw was just a, uh, a deviation between live and dead trees kind of post, kind of pine, almost post 1950, you know, 1960s, kind of leading into the 1970s, whereby those dead trees really stopped responding the same way to climate that the live trees did. So for instance, the live trees just negatively had a negative, a consistent negative response to winter precipitation in growth and resident development. So the more precipitation or the more snow was on the ground, it was essentially limiting photosynthesis. They weren't, you know, acquiring as much carbon. So growth and resident development both suffered. Um, but we actually saw it differences in the dead trees, where in some cases it would be a positive correlation in the latter half of the 20th century um, when looking at that same variable. So there was just a deviation between the live and the dead trees, but nothing really definitive um, that, that could have explained that difference. Kind of my thought is that maybe just, at, again, as those trees were stressed and kind of dying off the landscape, we might just be seeing a little bit of a reflection of that in the data. Um, but there's other things to think about too. I mean, as far as, uh, you know, I had someone once propose that it could be we could that could be a, a signal of a CO2 fertilization, for instance, where you know more CO2 the trees are responding with increased growth, the live trees relative to the dead trees. I don't feel confident enough to say that's the case, but um, I definitely think it's there's probably multiple factors that are influencing that. And I, I'm very curious for anyone <laughs> to talk to anyone about that because it, it is a really kind of interesting trend um, that I think is uh, it's it's a head scratcher. It's definitely something to think about. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the unfortunate thing about webinars is we lose some of the opportunity for more organic discussion. But if anyone has any comments on that, um, you can email them to me or um, and I'll get them to to Nick uh, for sure. So, okay, the next question is um, how and this is mechanistically might fewer larger resin ducts translate to greater defense. So uh, the person who asked this understands that greater duct area would equal more potential for resin transport, which should translate to more available resin, but is there a greater efficiency of flow um, and of investment in duct structure, like via reduced surface area to volume ratio? Ooh, you know, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I think that's that's actually kind of another thing that that probably warrants further research because there's, you know, one thing we do know about about resin is it's um, very sensitive to changes in in temperature. Um, so you know, when it's cold, it becomes a lot thicker uh, versus when it's warm, it flows a lot more freely. Um, so it's probably not only you know a function of the actual uh, anatomy and that kind of network of resin ducts, but also of just the kind of uh, abiotic conditions that are going to either promote or inhibit resin flow. Um, and as far as kind of the the dynamics of how you know size may kind of translate to flow, I mean that's I think there's been there was a study I can I, I'm blanking on the author unfortunately, but um, there was one study that recently came out that I believe looked at this, um, but it's it's something that I've, I it's something I would like to research more as well because I'm actually kind of curious how um, how these different factors you know how duct area um, and size translate to resin flow because um, we don't really know in a lot of cases i mean it's in, it's all very theoretical like yes it should um but there's a lot of factors that interact that could complicate that assumption um so i don't know if i really adequately answered that question but i think uh, it's definitely something i would like to, to uh, research as well and i think some again kind of maybe more controlled studies trying to uh you know specifically look at how things like changing temperature could influence resin viscosity and how that relates to resin duct anatomy uh would be really informative that'd be a really a really great study all right, thanks, Nick. Um, and then this is just a clarification. Uh, what elevation range were you looking at within your study sites or with your study sites? Yeah, good good question. I probably should have given some of that basic demography data, uh, but I, it was a, anywhere from around 1900, I think was our lowest elevation, 1900 meters to about 2100 meters. So kind of in that, in that range um, of elevation for the sites. And uh, the Three Lakes Peak was a little bit higher elevation um, so we looked at the sites differently, um, but we saw the same trends kind of across them, which is why we opted to kind of pool the data. Okay, and this next question, I'm going to butcher some of the pronunciation, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, this uh, 
participant is interested in the difference between the anatomers of limonene from the PCA of white bark versus lodgepole. Um, and there's some work from Christine Chu that suggests um, some is more toxic than others, <laughs> or negative is more toxic than positive. Do you think negative limonene could offset some of the more favorable characteristics of white bark chemistry? Yeah, definitely. And that's um, really, yeah, I thank you to the chemical ecologists of the world because <laughs> this has been a new world for me, kind of getting a grip on all of these different uh, mono and sesquiterpenes and, they, and antimers and how uh, these relate to bark beetle behavior and um, attack success. And I, I definitely do think there's got to be something there with, with limonene. I mean, there's some there's some reason why, why you know, in addition to just the host identification cue from beta philandrine, there's some reason why lodgepole preferentially just continue to go for, or I keep saying lodgepole, why mountain pine beetle kind of preferentially continue to go for lodgepole, even in the face of having white bark as a viable host. Um, so I think there could be something that there with, with limonene. Um, and I don't, yeah, I probably shouldn't speak too much on that. Um, you know, I was fortunately, able to work with, again, with doctors uh, Amy Trowbridge and Kenneth Rafa, who are very skilled chemical ecologists um, who helped kind of interpret some of the differences in the data. So that's definitely something I'll chat with them about. Um, but yeah, I think it's 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 really interesting in any event, the, the differences um, in that, in the chemistry that we're seeing. And yeah, I think um, it's, I'm excited for, for that paper and kind of for the opportunity to explore that further as part of that research. We're still kind of in the throes of it. So I won't speak too much on it yet, but um, yeah, really, really good observation. Okay, thanks. And I may connect you to that, uh, the person who asked that question via email just to make sure I actually got the question right. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, anyway. I would really appreciate that. Great. So um, this is a comment and question. Uh, excellent project. Look forward to hearing more about resin composition when you finish up that portion of your project. Um, your comment about breeding for resistance for white bark or white pine blister rust and the potential for inadvertently selecting trees with poor resin duct production is certainly worth looking into. And then as a follow-up to that comment, when in the life of a tree would it be appropriate to look for resin duct production? Does it change over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> I think the simple answer is we don't really know. Um, it's I, There's a kind of a critical need right now to do a study that looks at how resin duct anatomy potentially changes across ontogeny. Um, so we don't really know, you know, again, a lot of seedling, a lot of common garden experiments have looked at resin duct characteristics in seedlings, um, but that's very different from, you know, a, uh, a tree growing in kind of a natural mixed conifer forest. Um, so just it's it's really hard to tease apart in those natural settings, kind of what factors, you know, whether it be, again, some some combination of maybe microsite favorability or genetics, probably genetics, that's, um, you know, allowing these trees to kind of uh, have these different investments in, in growth and resin ducts. Um, but yeah, I think there's, we really don't know how these things change over the life of a tree. And I would be hesitant to say, you know, what the optimal age is to go kind of assess resin duct characteristics. It's gonna vary not only, uh, by environment and age, but also by species as well. Um, there's going to be some pretty clear differences in, in just resin duct anatomy as a function of, of differences in, in species and environment. So um, I think, yeah, that's a really, really big, important kind of need for research right now. Um, and I, yeah, I, the kind of fortunate thing is our site, um, you know, most of the white bark here kind of responded post 1910. You know, it's a big 1910 burn, and most of our growth at both sites kind of came up after that after that um, 1910 fire. So we kind of counted, you know, our white bark chronology, we did have some older samples that dated back to the 1600s, um, but really for this resin duct study, we had this kind of nice, you know, 90-ish year um, window in which to look at these characteristics. So um, in that sense, you know, the trees were great, uh, kind of, you know, like about a 90-year-old white bark is fantastic for looking at resin ducts, but um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, of nuance there and that's a really great question too. Okay, we have time for probably two more questions. Um, this one is related to the resin duct size in the live versus dead. So can you definitively say that resin duct size is larger in live trees? Uh, when wood is dry, it shrinks, so that may be a function of the size, or do you have any thoughts or clarifications there? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, and something I thought about too. I mean, we so when we take these increment cores, we air dried them all for 
uh, longer than we probably should. So they actually sat for two months in my office before I started um, processing them. And then I, you know, pulled them out and I'll air dry them as well. So, uh, it, you know, any, any moisture in the kind of uh, those live trees, you know, they typically are, uh, you know, wetter when you pull the core, but that's all kind of evaporated out um, and dried out by the time we go to mount and sand them. Um, so kind of, uh, I, you know, I think that's something that could be looked into further, but um, kind of just as a function of how we process the samples and how we kind of dry them out and then mount and sand them. Um, you know, I think the difference is, is legitimate. Like I think these live trees were just producing larger resin ducts um, as, you know, relative to the, the trees that ultimately died. Okay, I think this will be our last question. There's a couple more comments that I'll um, forward you via email. But um, so, was the resin anatomy different from Three Lakes compared to Boulder, since there's the orographic lift to be considered? Yeah, definitely. So we we saw the same trends in the data across the sites, but we did see some differences in the sites. And I'm actually gonna tease that a little bit too because that's uh kind of the third chapter of my dissertation is really delving into hey what what are the differences in climate and in uh aspect elevation slope you know these little these little things about topography uh, and how do those shape the differences we're seeing at the sites so uh, for instance despite having the same trends between growth and defense and mortality um the resin ducts typically were larger at the boulder site. Uh, it's a wetter site, so it receives more moisture. Um, you know, it's kind of right off Flathead Lake there than the Three Lakes site. Um, so that's something that I'm kind of currently exploring is, you know, what environmental factors, what climatic factors um, could be contributing to the differences we're seeing in resin ducts between sites. Um, and that's kind of another area of, of research that I think is, um, would be beneficial is kind of looking at um, you know, not just resin duct characteristics and growth in one population, but looking at them across multiple populations and saying like, hey, you know, is this observed difference in resin duct morphology that we're seeing in white bark pine on the flathead, you know, is that emblematic of white bark pine everywhere, uh, white bark pine in the greater Yellowstone? Like, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, those kind of studies would be really beneficial. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Nick. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, thanks all of you for being here uh, for the webinar. And again, you'll notice when you close out the webinar, a survey will pop up. And please just take a moment to give us some quick feedback. We really value it and um, actually use that to identify future research needs and that sort of thing. So I uh, hope you all have a great day. And thanks again for your participation. Great. Thanks so much, Signe, and thanks everyone. I really appreciate the wonderful comments and questions. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this research with you. And yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. I hope to be able to do it again. All right. Take care, everyone.